Maybe we could follow on, on your uh, breakthrough result, this uh, VB84, and you have also discovered content teleportation. Could you uh, explain a little bit of history about, about this di discovery? Well, as I said, a lot of scientific discovery, unfortunately, people are credited. Usually someone, one person is credited with making a discovery, but most discoveries don't happen that way. There are many people who get close to the idea or who who discover it but don't realize how important it is or they're not able to communicate very well how important it is, so on. So this happened with with the stuff I did with reversible computing and, and Rolf Landauer. In fact, the, the, the Maxwell demon was quite thoroughly and adequately reputed in 1914 by uh, Marian Smolkowski, the, the, the Polish uh, physicist. But what happened after that was that uh, that was before the discovery of quantum theory. So as soon as quantum theory was discovered and people realized that radiation was quantized, they started finding overly complicated reasons why Maxwell's demon couldn't work. Brewan was one of them who did it, but a very smart guy, Dennis Gabor, the inventor of holography, also came up with a, a much too complicated and too quantum-based explanation for something that had already been thoroughly explained by Smolkowski. Just be, it's, this is an example of how progress in one area of science can impede the understanding in another area. Because everybody, after quantum mechanics, they realized that measurement was a very problematic mm -hmm. thing. Certain kinds of measurements couldn't be done at all or couldn't be done in conjunction with other complementary measurements. So they jumped to the conclusion, without really thinking it through, that that meant that some measurement that could be done, like to find out whether the molecules on this side or that side, would have a certain thermodynamic cost that they wouldn't have had in a classical world. Well, that's not true. It's the same cost. And quantum mechanics and, and uh, thermodynamics constrain information processing in different ways. And essentially, Landauer was the one who started thinking about this more rigorously after some quite prominent physicists had, had spoiled the good understanding of Maxwell Demon that had already existed uh, decades earlier. And so I helped him do that. But you might say that's not a discovery. That's just sort of a re rediscovery. Now, with the BB84, the quantum cryptography, I think the, the, that's, that, that's a very interesting part of the history of this field of, of the physics of information or the science of information. And I would say that if you compare the, 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 the two parts of information processing, you could say roughly are communication and computation. Mm -hmm. And you would associate computation with Turing and communication with, with Shannon. Mm -hmm. And both of those people made tremendously fruitful abstraction, which, of which I would say that the Shannon's abstraction was the, the greater and the more stunning. The Turing, and, and not only Turing, I mean, say there were, there were Church and, 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 and uh, Kleene and, 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 and Gödel, the, the, that set of ideas of, that solidified the notion of computation into a a machine independent notion of what computation is. It, it, it doesn't matter what the hardware is. It doesn't even matter how complicated the machine is. If it's beyond a certain complexity, it can do all computations that can be done. And then there's some other computations that can't be done, like solving the Holton problem. So that was a great abstraction. And you to think of information processing without separate from the physical carriers of the information. Shannon's I, I discovery is, of course, is even more stunning because he thought of a a theory of communication in which the first thing that you did to, to build a theory was to forget about meaning. Most people would say, well, that's, uh, that's not only the wrong direction, that's the opposite direction from what you should be thinking about. But anyway, both of these, these people thought of computation and processing in classical, what a physics would call a classical, physicists would call classical terms. And of course, by the time computers were being built, even by the time of, of uh, Turing and, and Shannon, quantum mechanics was well understood pretty well. But people thought it just had to do with physics and chemistry, not with, with mathematics. Mm -hmm. And the, the, uh, the tools of information theory were very nicely suited to the problem of correcting errors, even the errors that come from the 
unpredictable quantum behavior of parts. Like if you make a transistor too small, it has more errors because it's because of quantum effects, as, among other things. So through all this time, people thought of quantum effects as something that you had to take if you were into mind if you were an engineer or, or uh, uh, designing a transistor. But if you were programming a computer, you didn't have to think about it, except you'd get extra errors. But you know how to correct errors because of the work of Shannon. Well, the first person who, that I think who made a really concrete step in realizing that information sh should be thought of in terms, in quantum terms, not classical terms, was Brandeis, classmate of mine, Stephen Wiesner. He is a kind of retiring person. He had these ideas while he was a graduate student in Columbia, and he, he tried to get them published, but he didn't succeed. Uh, and the two ideas were things that you can do with quantum effects that you couldn't do at all, or you can't even, you can hardly describe the problem. Or if you describe it, you, you can prove that it has no solution if you use Shannon's notion of information. And the two tasks that he figured out how to do in 1968, which is only 20 years after Shannon, was to make uh, money, banknotes, that are physically impossible to counterfeit. And to combine two messages, to multiplex them together into, a, into an optical signal, uh, a train of light pulses, that would, it was a peculiar kind of multiplex in the sense that you could read either message reliably, but you couldn't read both of them. So by reading one, you would have to give up your opportunity to read the other. Now, these, these two feats of, of information processing, uh, making something that can be recognized by a bank as legitimate, but if you have it, you can't copy it well enough for a bank to accept it, both take take advantage of the, of the fact that when you observe a quantum system, it disturbs it, and that you can't clone or copy quantum information. And so Wiesner re realized these were interesting things, and he told me about it in 1970. And I think that the notes that I took of our conversations may be actually the first time that the phrase quantum information theory was written down. He, he didn't try very hard to get this published. Eventually, he's published, uh, I think, 15 years later. But I started realized it was very important, started telling everybody about it. And I, one of the people I told about it was Gilles Brassard, who was the first computer scientist. And he said, well, you know, this is interesting. It should be interesting to computer scientists too. So we started working on it together. And we realized that, that Wiesner's quantum money would be a very impractical thing because you would have to preserve this, the, the, the coherent state of a photon or of a, a spin one half particle for, uh, you know, between the time that money was printed and when it was brought back to the bank which would be a thing in at least several days. And it, 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 maybe you can do it just barely nowadays with very expensive equipment, but you couldn't have done it back then. But we thought, we realized that this is much better for communication, transporting information than for storing it. So we, so we uh, used this and realized it was a, a basis of a, a cryptographic system. The, the idea of it isn't terribly different from quantum money. And I think maybe one reason that Wiesner didn't try to pursue this himself was because he didn't want to generate something that would be useful to the sort of the military industrial establishment uh, or that the whole field might get classified or something. So he, he just sort of, he, he wanted to stay away from anything that had a practical application. Well, we, we thought it was interesting and, and developed and even built the apparatus and, and, and with our students. In the course of building it, developed techniques that for the correcting the errors that occur and, and then getting rid of the errors without leaking too much information to the eavesdropper who presumably is listening to your error correcting discussion. So that's how that happened. The other thing you were asking about is that quantum teleportation. The other thing that Wiesner did and that again he told me about but didn't write it up, but I helped him write it up and we published a joint paper about it in 1992 was how you can use what we now call an entangled state of two of two qubits to transmit one of four messages by sending one of the qubits to to the receiver before you decided which measure message you wanted to send and then you could manipulate the other one in one of four ways and send it on so this this violates the idea that a two that a two state quantum system can carry at most one bit of information this allows it to carry two bits if it's previously entangled with something that you give to the receiver beforehand. 
So this was a very interesting communication task too. And we'll write at, not long after that, Gilles and, and I and, and uh, uh, Bill Wooters and Richard Josa and Claude Cropot were all at a lecture given by Bill Wooters in the University of Montreal. And Wooters had written a paper with Asher Perez, who at that time, well, was in Technion in Israel, puzzling over a kind of quantum paradox. And this was a question of if you have, you know, I said that you can't get more than one bit out of a photon. So if you have two photons and they're each polarized, not in two orthogonal states, but they're, you promise that you make them both in the same state and they're they're both vertical or they're both at 120 degrees or 240 degrees. So there's equally spaced three states apart. There's no way that you can distinguish those three states reliably, unless you have a lot of photons. But if you just have one, or even if you just have two, you can't distinguish them reliably. Mm -hmm. But what Paris and, and Wooters were trying to explore is how well can you distinguish them? And there's a certain, if you have the two of them together, you can perform a joint measurement and you know how well you can distinguish them. Mm -hmm. But if you have the two of them separately in separate laboratories, how can you go about this person makes a measurement on this one and reports their result to this guy who then makes a measurement on this one. It can be a very gentle measurement so that it's not disturb it too much, reports back. They tried, they couldn't get it to do as well mm -hmm. when they were being measured separately, even by very complicated and adaptive and slowly gentle measurements the best they could think of couldn't do as well. And they were wondering why. And the paper is one of these nice papers where they published it in physical review letters, even though it didn't answer a question, it just asked a question. <laughs> That's a very good kind of paper. And in their paper, they said, in a way, this is, this is a, a duel of the famous Bell inequality violating correlations of entangled particles. There you have two particles that are prepared together and behave strangely when they're measured separately. And here you have two particles that are prepared separately, but you can get more information out of them when you measure them together. So they said, this is, this is some, this phenomena must be related. So we were sitting around after the talk about this result, which was just a question. And we were kind of, uh, you know, we had a kind of a brainstorming session or a bull session we said, well, you know, what are these two guys missing? Is there something we can give them that they don't have already that would somehow help? And being aware of this other paper, I'm, I'm not, I think it was me, but it might have been somebody else said, well, why don't we just give them a pair of, of EPR particles, an entangled pair of particles, can't hurt, you know, give them something else. Give them the thing that has the other property that's sort of dual to this. And then one of the other people said, well, measure, maybe you could somehow measure I think it was Claude Chopin said, could you, maybe you could measure if you've got your EPR particle and this uh, one copy of this unknown three state particle, maybe you could somehow measure the relation of this to this. And I said, because I'd sat through so many chemistry lectures, not really understanding the quantum mechanics. You mean trying to figure out whether they're a singlet or a triplet or something like that? And this computer scientist said, what's a singlet and a triplet? And, uh, but Bill Waters knew what they were. And so we're all seriously scratching our heads about this. We went home without solving the problem. But then finally, it dawned on several of us how to do it, which is that you do measure the relation between one of the three states that you're trying to, and, and this entangled particle. Uh, and you measure it in a, some, in a way that doesn't tell you anything about either the particles, only about their relation. And then you use that to make the better measure of the other particle. It took us a while longer to think that it wasn't just a better way of doing this job, but essentially we had, we had actually teleported the other, the particle to the other lab. Uh, and I suggested that word, but Asher Perez says, oh, that's an, that's a, uh, he was a stickler for language. He said, that's, that's a barbarism because tele is <laughs> Greek and portation is, is Latin. So you should call it telephoresis. And the other people said, come on, everybody loves teleportation. So they, they we overruled them. So that's how that happened. Is there any other uh, important discovery that you would like to share? This is, this is something that I was involved in with uh, maybe my most recent work in, in quantum information. Uh, the, the, these two processes of using entanglement to send more classical information through a, a channel than you could otherwise do, which was discovered by Wiesner, and teleportation, which is that you use classical information to transmit a quantum particle if you have entanglement but no quantum channel. 
a quantum state, but not a quantum particle. Oh, I love, I wanted to tell you a story about Asher, our, our Asher Paris, he was a famously anti-religious person. Uh -huh. And he, he complained that, that, that re the religion has too strong an influence in Israel. And so he would always work extra hard on Saturday. And so one time somebody asked him the perfect question. And he, he really felt lucky that somebody asked this question. And, and they said, if you teleport a person, will it teleport their soul? or just their body? And he answered, only the soul. So, so I think, as you can tell by now, I think that humor has a very important part in science. Mm -hmm. uh, and the last thing, or the, the thing that you're asking about, which I thought was, is a, is a little bit related to the connection between t teleportation and, and this uh, we Wiesner dense coding, sending more, than, more bits than the capacity of the, mm -hmm. of the, of the qubit. So it, it occurred to, me that the fact that entanglement will will allow a quantum channel that carries one qubit to be replaced by a classical channel that carries two two bits in both directions like mm -hmm. if i have if i have that entanglement i can use either of these two resources to to simulate the other mm -hmm. and so in a sense entanglement is the great equalizer it mm -hmm. takes channels that are qualitatively different and makes them comparable Mm -hmm. So I said, is, is, could that mean that really entanglement is the thing that simplifies the whole theory of quantum channels? Mm -hmm. And so that, of course, as soon as quantum, quantum uh, information was discovered, people realized that quantum channels have different kind of capacity. Capacity for sending classical bits, mm -hmm. the channel that I'm using to you now has no quantum capacity. I can't send a qubit through it unless we have shared entanglement. Mm -hmm. And then there's intermediate capacities like a, a secrecy capacity. So there's lots of capacities and they have different formulas. And somehow the idea that if you give enough entanglement, you can equalize all that. And you just say, well, it's a, it's a channel that has a capacity. So we beca I be began wondering about that. We wrote a paper called the quantum reverse Shannon theorem. Yeah, yeah. But before the quantum reverse Shannon theorem, we thought of the classical reverse Shannon theorem. That, that was an idea that I said, well, gee, if you use, if you can, if a channel has really only one kind of capacity, you ought to be able to solve the problem of not only of, of that Shannon cared about, because he wasn't a pure scientist, he was an engineer and, and worked for a telephone company, that of using a, a noisy channel to simulate an ideal noiseless channel. I said, well, what if you want to do the reverse? What if you want to take a, a, a noisy, noiseless channel and simulate a noisy channel? Well, my colleague John Smolin said, well, that's an easy way. Homer Simpson would know how to do that. You just send the data through the channel and then mess it up afterwards, or maybe mess it up first and then send it through the channel. And I said, no, that's not what I mean. I, I, if you have a 10% noisy uh, bit channel that has a capacity of about half a bit per, per channel use, what I want to do is to use n uses of the, of the noiseless channel to simulate two n uses of the noisy channel. Mm -hmm. And can we do that? And we figured out mm -hmm. we could do that. Well, this, this whole topic had been addressed by Shannon, but in a, in a sort of more limited context of of uh, rate distortion theory, where the mm -hmm. idea is you were trying to do something useful. You weren't trying to simulate a noisy channel. You were trying to simulate a channel that was bad and not good in some way that you didn't care about. But I said, what, you know, essentially because I hadn't studied enough information theory to, to you know, to have learned about rate distortion theory. I said, just, just try to simulate a bad channel. It's, it's like saying, we're, we've got, we know how to desalinate water and we have some water, but we don't want to make it perfect water because we're not going to drink it, we're just going to use it to wash our car. How efficient can you can you make this car washing water out of good water? So, you know, using a reverse desalination part. So we it, essentially we show that shared randomness, stream sender and receiver can do that job and essentially equalize the capacity of one channel to simulate another, which wouldn't be equal if you didn't have this shared resource of shared randomness. And then we said, well, we ought to be able to do that also for quantum channels where the shared resources entanglement. And it became much more complicated and interesting because when you simulate a quantum channel, when you say simulate a channel, you mean you have to simulate it on any possible input, even in block coding, if the blocks are entangled with each other. And it turned out that you can't use just ordinary entanglement and be sure that it'll work on that kind of thing because the amount of entanglement you use might depend on which part of the input space is it, the input fell into. And by monitoring the environment of the sender and receiver, you could figure out 
something about the input, which of course would spoil the, uh, the it would essentially be eavesdropping on the channel. So you had to figure out some way of using entanglement, a kind of entanglement resource in which after you've done using it, you're not sure how much you used. And there's two ways of doing that, uh, which are kind of fun. One is the entanglement of bezeling state that was discovered by, by uh, Van Damme and Hayden, Patrick Hayden. That, that's a, uh, that's, well, I, I, I won't get into that, but that's, we call it an entanglement in bezeling state because like embezzling from a bank account, if you find some way of taking a little bit of money from everybody so that a penny from everybody and nobody notices and then you get very rich, but nobody realizes they've been robbed. That's sort of what the, this entangled resource is like. Or you can use it by, it's sort of like when uh, an airplane has to land, but it's too heavy to land. So it flies around in circles for a while to burn up the extra fuel. Uh, in the old days, it would have just dumped it on the ground, but that's not environmentally very nice. So this other way of simulating a channel that you actually have to do to make the reverse Shannon theorem work is if you have leftover entanglement to get rid of it in a way that nobody finds out whether you ever had it. And you can do that by sending by back classical back communication from the receiver to the sender. So it, it turned into a kind of fascinating little puzzle, but it grew out of a very simple idea. Can you find some resource that is so powerful that it makes all kinds of capacity just equivalent to one another. And what we like to say is that when, and, and this was another uh, outcome of, of, of the first paper that we wrote on this, this, this is with uh, Ashish Tapial, uh, 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 John Smolin and, and uh, Peter Shore, who's called the classical reverse Shannon theorem and, and entanglement assisted capacity. Well, what Shannon discovered in, in 1948 was a very nice formula for the entanglement assisted capacity of a quantum channel. Now, he didn't realize that's what he was discovering, but if, if a quantum channel happens to be incapable of sending quantum information, only classical information, then its entanglement assisted capacity is just equal to its Shannon capacity. But the two are actually given by exactly the same formula. Uh, so entanglement assisted capacity is not only a nice concept that equalizes all channels, but it's actually given by the same Shannon formula Whereas quantum capacity, which would seem like the capacity you should be thinking about in quantum information theory, is a much more problematic and complicated idea. And there isn't a simple formula for it. But that's the, that's the most recent stuff in, in quantum information that I've, that I've been work, working on that I found exciting. Yeah. So this, this part of research of yours actually uh, influenced my, uh, my early career a lot. You look young enough that, do you have any other part of your career except your early <laughs> 